I don't want to give a big introduction what is JS. Free and open source desktop JS systems, they're ready, almost ready for the desktop. Today I want to talk about spatial data infrastructures. Yeah, one of my main interests is free software and especially geospatial free software. So the question I want to answer of the talk is what is an SDI? So what is a spatial data infrastructure? What are the software requirements for it? What free software is out there? So that will be the main point. And then can we basically implement SDA successfully with free software? Why do we have spatial data infrastructures? Is we have islands of data of different standards and quality, particular spatial data. What are these islands? These islands are different government agencies or different city departments. So you say you have the traffic department, but you have the department which is responsible for green spaces and these things. So they collect data, but they also should bring them together. They may be needed by other departments for, for their tasks. Can be also NGO, NGOs or company departments too. So the objectives of a spatial data structure, basically just the distribution of geographic data to multiple users. The second point is then providing a central access point to geographic data. Say, I want to know something about green spaces. There needs to be a reason or, or a place where I can find that. So it requires cataloging all these data, and then I can search for what I want. But still, by even having like a central point of access, we want that these data are maintained by experts. The people who created the data are usually the experts in the data, so they should also maintain that. Then we want to standardize storage and acquisition, because uh, then we don't get a problem if people collect data for different reasons. Standardize it, you can better use them multiple times. That's another big thing, is saving resources. If everybody collects data for its own purposes and is not sharing them, then we have a lot of duplication of efforts in terms of data acquisition, but also in distribution and updating data. Collect once, use multiple times. Spatial data infrastructure is a coordinated series of agreements on technology standards, institutional arrangements, and policies that enable the discovery and use of geospatial information by users and for purposes other than those it was created for. So out of that, we can get the components of spatial data infrastructure. So first, we have the spatial data, or what he calls information. Still a step from spatial data to information. It's one component. The other component is the technologies, which we'll use, so software, hardware. Then we have people which are our users, or even the providers. So data providers, service providers, users. And we have arrangements. These arrangements, especially if you talk about international data infrastructures, they go into laws and policies. So we have, for instance, in Europe, the INSPIRE, which is a project at a European level. Quite a lot of policy involved, too. And then there are the standards, acquisition, representation of data, but transfer of data, too. When talking about laws and policies and people, so it's, it's not only a technical thing, it's also a social thing in some respect. I brought three case studies to give an impression what it is or what is an SDI. National mapping agencies, for instance, EGN France, they have a spatial data infrastructure. The objective of EGN is to create maps, maintain data, create data, and deliver these data to other customers. Customers or data users are on the one hand, the in-house people, which do the map creation, but it's also governmental administrations, people who care about in environmental aspects. But they have also a lot of data deliverers, which are from the one hand, they have a big in-house department which collects data. I think there's like 150 people which just drive over France every day and update data. But they get data from the forestry administration, but also road administration, because they need this data to do the maps. Second example is the Marina Map Information System, California, USA. The objectives here have been to provide a decision support system for designing marina protected areas. Data users here are the resources managers, or scientists, and the public. So public means just people who want to see what's going on, seeing the maps. What is Winston living in that certain area of the coast? Finally, a third example is Rick Waterstadt, a pretty big organization. There are about 10,000 people working there. And their task is to prevent flooding, ensure water quality and safety, but also ensure unimpeded movements on roads and waterways. So they basically map infrastructure of the Netherlands from waters to roads. So they have data users in-house to do the maintenance operations of the roads and waterways, but also other public agencies use their data. And data delivery is, of course, in-house too. So they have people who drive along the roads, along the waterways. They have sensors, just measure things automatically. But they also get data then from other public agencies, for instance, data on topography and soil. One aspect is to include policy decisions. For instance, uh, where I'm allowed to build something. So you should have a bit of an idea what is a spatial data infrastructure coming to the technical requirements. So I talked about three types of uh, people components. So we have service provider on the one hand. We have a data provider 
and we have a, a user of the data. And the idea is that all these things go via the internet. In theory, you know, the data provider just would work over the internet too. So what do these people need? The data provider usually has a JS software, so to create and update the JS data. The service provider needs to provide the services first, on the one hand, like serving maps to several clients. Service provider also stores the data. The data which comes from different data providers will be stored in a central storage so we can access them and deliver them over the internet. And on the client side, we have client software, which is used to display, query, analyze JS data, or people would usually say maps. So we could here just put a Google map here, or a Google Earth. There might be two more components, one component is a catalog registry software or service server, which basically is to discovery, browse, and query metadata. So all this data you get have some type of metadata telling you what is the location, what have these data been made for, what do they contain. The idea here is basically like a yellow pages thing. On the other side, we have JS service server. Certain customers need parts of the product. So for instance, the data you get delivered you want to have them in a certain cartographic projection. Google Earth data or Google Maps data are delivered in a worldwide projection. But if, you, if you're if you used to the projection which is used in a country, your cartographic projection, you need to transform that into this projection. So that's what these services can do. But they can also just analyze your data. Let's say you find here where these uh, catalog registry servers, you find information about McDonald's stores and you find information about the roads in your town and you want to create yourself a map with both information, then maybe there is a service server who can do that. In terms of technical requirements, there are also lots of standards to ensure the interoperability between the components, which are on the one hand communication protocols between servers and clients. Then we have data formats. We also think about data and service descriptions. Basically, you always think about the internet because most of these things go in via the internet. So it's not that much different from browsing and HTTP and these things. So these things are based on that. And these standards have been defined by at least three different agencies which are used. So there's the Open Geospatial Consortium, which focuses on particular interoperability between geospatial software. Then there is the International Standard Organization, which specifies standards for metadata and geographic information services. And finally, we transfer the data over the web. We have to look on web standards too. So it's HTML, it's XML, or the graphic standards, SVG, so what is there in terms of standards? We have data delivery standards, web mapping services. It's for instance, what you would get with Google Maps. Then you have web feature services, which means you get data in a vector format. So you can basically change things on your own. So it's not ready made or finalized. And web coverage services uh, for delivering images, georeferenced images. And then as additional here, I put the transactional VFS or VFS standard which means you are allowed to write back data to the database. That might be important if you have people collecting some data somewhere else. So for instance, OpenStreetMap, if you have the access rights. Then there are data formats. So it's a simple feature standard, which defines you know, what type of geometries we have and, and also a couple of operations to analyze data. Then there's a geography markup language, GML, and keyhole markup language, KML, which has been introduced by Google. Then there's the OGC data search standards, because that's one of the ideas. We want to search data, find data, which sounds even better. So there's a catalog service and a gazetteer service. So this is server-based. Gazetteer service is more client-based. So you operate with that on a client. And then there are a couple of other standards which are interesting. So the web processing standard, the coordinate transformation services, web terrain services, static layout descriptor, so that's about presentation, representation. So these are the ones, or most of them come into play if we think about uh, spatial data infrastructures. What are the software needs? So that's the this, this slide I had earlier. So we would have then here on the data provider side our desktop JS to create data, maintain data. On the client side, we have desktop, can have desktop JS too, depending on what the user's interested, what he wants to do. So if he wants to do analysis, might be desktop JS, but if he's just interested in get some information, then it might be even a web JS, so in a browser, let's say the Google Maps. But then I put your software uh, web JS toolkits because someone has to develop these interfaces. And then we would here have on a service provider side, we have the web map servers, and for the spatial data storage, we have spatial database management systems. Then catalog registry, there's, of course, a catalog registry and metadata software, software to create metadata. And finally, for the GS services, where there are web GS servers. So and I would now go through these different types of software and see what's basically on the market. Reordering things a bit, who are actually the drivers of this uh, software development? 
spatial data infrastructures, at least recently, more and more have or have been interest of governments and, and, and NGOs. So there, especially governments, are a big pro, uh, financial supporter of software developments in that area, at least for the certain parts which are not already there, so the missing pieces. However, we have other ac actors, companies, especially in Canada, there are like two, three companies who worked on desktop software systems and PostJS, the database system, that's actually a Canadian product too. Then web server stuff came originally a lot from universities, but we have also a bunch of enthusiasts which just are interested in that stuff. So, well, let's say often university students. And I would say from all the Phosphor.js projects we have, and let's say that survived, I would estimate only one-tenth has been really founded by enthusiasts. So half is probably universities, half is companies. Starting with the software, so I start with the server software. The standards here, so for web map servers, which are important, are the WMS standard, the WFCs. Oh, should be WF. S standard for vector data, and WCS standard for raster data. And then the two additional ones might be the processing service and transactional uh, feature service to deliver or write it back. So property equivalence, so that's how the slides will all be a bit ordered. So I'll try to find an equivalent if I know about it, but I'm not very good in that area. So as Esri is one of the main data or Software providers, I usually put some of their products here. So for web map server, the propriety equivalent would be the Esri Arc IMS. I think now it's just called Arc Server. Uh, but there's also Autodesk Map Guide, for instance. So at least uh, four big uh, projects. Uh, one is Map Server. I also put the licenses here, so it has an XMIT license, so it's kind of more free, and it supports. Yeah, the main standards I mentioned earlier. It's actually a project which come out of a university. GeoServer is another of the bigger projects. Uh, has a different license, GPL. There's also this Java based, so if you're interested in programming all these things. Supports also the main standards. But the origin of this one is I don't know really. However, then there's uh, the Autodesk map guide. So it has a propriety origin or they call it Autodesk Map Guide Open Source. Uh, so, but there's also a proprietary project running in parallel. Uh, services or the standards which are supported are a bit less, at least for the open source product. If you would get the full product, that's probably a bit different. So you have only the map service and the feature service. Uh, finally, there's Degree, that's a German project, and it's more a a framework, a development framework, so you have lots of different things. You will see it on the later slides. License the LGPL, so it's a bit more open. And you see it uh, supports a range of uh, standards. And then there are other ones too. So recently, if you have heard of desktop project QuantumJS, they also have some guy who programmed a, a web map server based on the rendering engine, which supports two standards. And then there are new, I'm not sure if you have heard of these REST-based approaches. So you know you have the URL and you send the stuff. Everything you do is sent in the REST, which is behind, what is it, the question mark? So these things. And there are two server, two products, let's call them products, uh, out there too. One is called Feature Server and one is GeoREST. So my impression for this type of, or for web map services, that web map server outperform proprietary products so far. And in particular, strong are map server and geo server. So I have to say that's really my impression is people from, yeah, other people would think in a different way. But it just in terms of number of installations and where they are used. Uh, Second is the WebJS server. The idea here was processing spatial data remotely. So we have uh, at least two standards which are important. This is the OGC 
WPS standard and the ISO 1900 standard. Proprietary equivalents, I'm, I'm not really sure what is out there because it's all pretty new. So that's, I think the standard is out since two, three years at earliest. And even, even research does work on that like maybe four or five years, so it's pretty new. So a, a server or a proprietary product is Arc Server, SV Arc Server. And then there might be some from PCI Geomatics. I couldn't really find that. But, but they, are, they had some product which, or they have kind of a better version or something like that, or development version, which was compliant to the uh, OGC WPS standard. So and here there's, I would say, only three uh, kind of products. Well, kind of. So there is the 252 North project, or, and they have a North, well, 52 North WPS server, licenses GPL, and that's actually more, hmm. the company is not really a company, so it's a, a mixture of, of industry and university, so they do a bit of research too. So they basically, use, they try to sell open source. Kind of. Uh, and and they, but their big thing is uh, sensor web applications. So then there's PyVPS, Py, PyWPS. So Python based. Um, uh, what does to say here? That that's yeah. It's basically an interface software. So you, I will talk later about another famous uh, desktop JS. This is Grass. So you can put this, let's say, in front of this desktop JS, and then you can access the functionality of that desktop JS. And then there's, again, the degree framework uh, with all its different types of standards. My impression here is that uh, fast and proprietary solutions tie, since WPS is a new thing, so not that, there's not that much development on the, on the proprietary side yet. However, I assume if you buy a proprietary product, so at least the Arc, ArcGIS server should be well better documented. But things are really in, in motion here. So it might be in, in two, three years, could be already look com completely different. So coming then to the spatial data management systems. So idea of storing spatial data, sometimes also processing. The basic standard here is the OGC simple feature specification. Uh, yeah, there's not that much to say. So which says, you know, which actually defines uh, these things like spatial data types, spatial joins, query types, spatial indexing for a database. So that's what you should know. Basically, uh, spatial database management systems are extensions of normal existing projects. So proprietary equivalent is Oracle Spatial, so Esri Arc SDE, kind of. Well, actually, Arc SDE is not really an own database. Well, it is a management system, but you still need to buy a database. <laughs> and for instance, the DB2, EBM DB2 Spatial Extender. And I found at least there are three bigger projects, kind of. So the most famous one is PostJS, this one, Canadian product from Refractions. Uh, we have then also MySQL Spatial. So PostGIS hooks up on PostgreSQL. And then there's MySQL Spatial, which is built in, in MySQ for the MySQL database. And then there's finally Spatial Lite, which is fought for SQLite. Interesting here, the license is public domain. Uh, so they all support uh, the o OGC simple feature specification. The only thing is with this one, so well, the MySQL one is used already, or at least what I get from conference is used in a couple of spatial applications. But the problem is queries and these things only work on bounding rectangles, so they are less accurate. They are still fast, but it's not really standard compliant. So they did the standard, they resolved the standard only half. Let's put it that way. 
So, and then there are lots of developments ongoing right now. So, you know, basically a matter of funding. So there's Hibernate, Hibernate Spatial, people working on that, H2 Spatial, and also Ingress, uh, people that look for us or develop on spatial component for Ingress or Extender. And then you may have heard there are these so-called no SQL databases right now. So which doesn't mean they are not so they're not processing SQL, but they are just different. <laughs> and so there have been experiments with CouchDB and MongoDB, but as far as I know, there is no no implementation yet of spatial queries. So it's just normal queries, or there's no indexing used in these things. So it's, it's really experiments. Things are going on here. So my impression here would be that. PostJS, but also spatial aid type of proprietary solutions. Others still need a lot of work, but if you consider the price, so depends on what uh, setting you use, for instance, Oracle Spatial or DB2 Spatial Extender, that might be half a million. Huh? If you can get PostJS for free, that makes a difference. So catalog registry software. Uh, okay, the idea here was we store metadata on services and geodata. So not only geodata, but also services which are offered. So And this will allow us to discover, browse, and query services and data. Two standards are important here. These are ISO standards, metadata and geographic services. And I have no clue if there's any proper propriety equivalent. So maybe I just was too lazy to search for that, but I haven't even heard of that. But there must be something out there, I think so. At least Esri will work on these things. <laughs> but this might be then really proprietary. Uh, so the things I found, the most, well, yeah. So one is a Geo Network open source. So you see it supports uh, the main standards or the standards needed. Oh, that's actually wrong, I read, but this is just open source, Geo Network open source.net. Well, actually, in terms of people who write, if you send me an email later, that's no, I can send you the presentation. So. Uh, interesting here, this uh, Geo Network Open Source, one of the, let's say, customers is a UN food agency. So they got kind of co-funded by them. Then there's MD Web, a French project, or has it already in origin in France? I can't say that much about this one, but it supports, supports the necessary standard. And again, there is degree, uh, which is yeah, this all encompassing mapping framework, development framework. Others, so I just interesting might be a free desktop metadata editor, which is called CatMD Edit, supports, of course, the the basic standards here, and it's actually used by a couple of map mapping agencies. So that and funded too, so it shouldn't be that bad if they use it. So my impression here for these things, uh, geo, geo network open source seems to be the most adopted solution, though degree is, has been used in several implementations too, uh, especially in Germany. So I actually I should say degree is a, that's actually one company who, who does the product. It's kind of an open thing, so you, you can't have access to the sources, but the developments itself, I'm not sure how, how much they go back. And it's more complicated to work with, if I, at least I heard it. So far I heard that. So then we come to the last category, the client software. So I start with the desktop JS. So idea, viewing, querying, creating, updating, analyzing, and printing geodata. So say make your own maps. So the minimum standard to access map maps from service as the OGC WMS, so viewing maps, raster-based. And from the major projects presented last year, so I was talking about eight, I think, uh, I would say six plus one. So I actually made only six, and now I figured out that one got WMS standard two. So only six of them, well, seven, support this standard. Uh, some other standards, like the WST to write things back, KML, or processing may require a plugin. So some of the desktop clients 
have support for these things too, but they may require an additional plugin. And then I meant to want to mention too that there are several free of cost uh, software out, for instance, Spring.js, which may have similar functionality, but I'm not looking on free of cost. Proprietary equivalents, of course, are ArcGIS, is Arc Explorer, and then that there are several desktop products from Autodesk, Bitnibos, Intergraph, Bentley. So I picked these six ones which is, as the major ones. So Grass, the oldest, the old horse, maybe. Some call it even the legacy software, and then other people are pretty bad about calling it legacy. <laughs> so, yeah, so it has a long tradition. I find it still a bit difficult to, to use it. I haven't looked at it. Now it's even Windows. We're running on Windows. Then there's uh, GVSIC. The it actually has an interesting background, the software. It's from the government of Valencia. It was funded by the government of Valencia in Spain. And the idea was to, to replace ArcView in administration. So which means the, the target group of that software project here is, so the GVSIC project, is really administration and a bit of research. So disadvantage of that, so oh, the advantage is too, they have lots of money. They got like 40 million for a couple of years in terms of support to make the developments. Disadvantage is a strong Spanish user group. So <laughs> I'm not sure what the difference is in tra traffic in the Spanish user group and the English speaking one. However, uh, it, they try to become more and more international. So and the product doesn't look that bad. So. I've never worked with it, but oh, very famous who? is Quantum GIS. Yeah, very strong user community and supports the major standards too. Functionality is not that awesome yet, but I would say if you give them like two years, and they, they had releases now every four months because they got so much uh, feedback, so much community people working on it. So I think in, in two, two years, they might be really, really good. That's a project I was working on, or I'm working on, is OpenJump. Has an origin in, actually in Canada, the original software. Supports a couple of standards, you see that, but most of them are via plugins. So this focuses more on editing the software. And as MapWindow is the only software which is C sharp based. So if you're like a Windows person, then this is perfect for you and you shouldn't look at the other ones. Maybe. Uh, what is maybe interesting to know here, so the standards plugin based, but uh, they have at least one big customer, which also is the UN Environmental Protection Agency or something like that. So there's some funding there too. So yeah, just to say like GVSIC and MAP, uh, that's company-based background. This was original army is now lots more research background, so university people. Map window has a university background, but uh, got a pretty good su mm, support, but it has a lot of people who work in companies due to the license they choose, which is open. UDIC is another company project, so the, the Third software from another Canadian com from Refractions, the Canadian company, and you see it also strong focus on supporting standards. <laughs> so if you would actually look for support, I mean, Udic might be the closest one because these guys are si si situated or they have the headquarter in Victoria, <laughs> just going over there. So uh, there's lots of more software. So the one which I didn't mention is uh, Ilvis, another software with a um, university research background. And from the Netherlands, my impression here is you can replace proprietary products for a certain range of tasks. So replacement depends on tasks, which is viewing, editing, analysis. So depending what you want to do. However, I still think creating real nice maps for GS newbie is hard with this type of software. It's still hard. But there have been, even over the past one and a half years, quite a bit of an improvement. So especially QuantumGS has now 
if you want a simple map, it goes very well, I think so. H have you checked that recently? No. But they have now this m mapping layout thing, so it should work. Then, as an STI, so in, in the context three we have right here, as an STI client, I would say GVSIG might be strong due to its project focus on administration. So I'm not sure about how Quantum JS develops there. In, in UDIC, well, it depends on funding. So then finally, web development toolkits. So ideas, viewing maps and querying geodata within a web browser. So Mozilla or something like this. Uh, sometimes they also offer more advanced functions. So you know, even editing, so not just querying and viewing. So at least again here, WMS standard should be supported. And the range here for these toolkits is from simple map viewer projects to complete web map development toolkits. Propriety equivalence, the one I know is at least their ArcJS web mapping AP, API, which uh, using the Flex standard, the JavaScript standard, and Silverlight. So um, I tried to order it a bit this way. I didn't give much information. It's really hard to figure out what's going on because so much uh, going on there. So viewers, just viewer applications, you see here open layers in a map window. It's basically the most used right now. I would say it's like a Google Maps without data. But you can get the data, for instance, from the NASA or from OpenStreetMap. Uh, so as it like, you get a raster image. So that might be not that nice. And somebody prefer, prefer more fleshy things. So there is an open scales project, fairly new, I think like two years old. Uh, they work on a flex-based viewer. Then we're complete geoportal toolkits. Two of them are map bender and degree. So you may, if you want to really, if you're a municipality and you want your users give access or the people living in a city give access, you may have a look on those tools, for instance. But it, yeah, yeah. So still, it always needs lots of work. So you need a program on these things. And then there are web map development toolkits. I just put, was it five? Five here. GeoMyas, GeoX, GeoMoose, MapFish, and SharpMap. So SharpMap is more for people who prefer Windows-based platforms. Uh, and I should also say, like, these toolkits like GeoMyas and GeoX or MapFish, they all include the open layers uh, application. So they, it comes with the application. Even, uh, you know, when I talked about the, well, GeoNetwork, well, there's a uh, cataloging software, which also delivers open layers included. So and then, of course, besides this special map, mapping stuff, there is uh, other toolkits, which you might consider as Google Web Toolkit or Google Gears. And then if it comes to spatial operations or just database connections, you may look also on GeoTools and SharpMap to realize those. My impression here is lots of toolkits are out. And I would say they're probably way better than any propriety toolkits, as it's still a new thing. A drawback may be that this doesn't come from one source. So, so, so you have to put the pieces together so it's a bit harder. But there are lots of tutorials out there. So summarizing this section, uh, we have software, open source software, in each of the categories we need. But I found that a particular competitive in comparison to proprietary software with respect to functionality are GeoServer and MapServer, PostJS as a database, then the GeoNetwork open source uh, software for catalog and registry, open layers as a web map viewer, then basically all web mapping toolkits. And for desktop GS, I'd say it depends on the task. So <laughs> then of course we have a pricing advantage especially for a database management system. And paid support is available. So for those who don't know, it is really out there. And even regional support networks emerge now. So finally, well, almost finally, one more, how to select among FOSS software. 
could be of general interest too. That's one of the things I recently was thinking about. So giving these talks to people who don't really know what it's about, so I was thinking about how could, what is different, you know? How should, how should you approach selecting FOSS software because there is so many. So as I said, I have lots of projects before, especially the, the desktop ones that were like six plus one at least, so we need to choose. Uh, how, why can't we select it like proprietary software is because we have different licenses. We have totally different development and distribution models. And you also may you know, get your support for free. So the software evaluation process I put up is we always start with a use case for your company or wherever you are, or your municipality. Well, one use, not your one use case. You usually should have several. So what should your users do? And you go to the evaluation criteria, make out of this use case evaluation criteria, do the evaluation, weight the different criteria, and finally pick based on the weighting. Uh, yeah, that's just in short because I don't have that much time. Uh, so the selection criteria, so looking on the second part here, yeah, uh, they should address software features, so functionality, what platform, which standards are supported, so which standards are important here in our SDI context, reliability, credibility, so where has it been used elsewhere before? Are these people happy? You know, maybe sometimes you can just ask because it's free software. Stability plays a role, of course, and options for customization. Then costs, most people don't think about that, but if you're in a, a company environment, first there are costs for switching, which are natural, but you also have costs for maintenance and training. So if you're bringing in new software, probably someone needs to be trained first. Some, it depends on the software. So say desktop JS, you maybe not need a training, but if it comes to server software, it looks already a bit different. Support, do I have support around me? So are there options? Maybe in the, civi in the city, are there costs? What is the cost of the support? And then we need to look on the community too, both developer and user, because this will define what is the longevity, longevity of the project. So are there enough people to maintain the project in the future too? To see what are the goals of the project? Does it, is it conform with my goals or do they plan to div divert in some, some, uh, some point? Uh, so, you know, for instance, you're looking on a, on a viewing application for maps. Just want to have a map for viewing. But they decided they want to go into analysis. So it's not of your interest. And so you maybe not consider this project anymore. And then the size is, of course, a support factor. And important in terms of community is too, who has influence on the development. So if you know, there's basically one company which does most of the development then it could be good or bad for you. So if you conform with what the company wants, then it's nice. But if not, you know, they want the button and then they just get the button and then you're the one who's screwed because you don't want the button. But it's an option for you too because you may have the power if you're a big organization to say, I want the button and then you get the button. And then finally, a license type. So depending on what you want to do later, if you think about extending the software, then the license type will influence if you're allowed to keep the extensions private or not. So talk about GPL versus LGPL versus Mozilla licenses. So if more than five products are available, it may be worthwhile to do an initial screening to retrieve a set of candidates and then do a, the in-depth evaluation of these candidates. And questions, I think, which we should always ask for, this, or for a screening, so first, in terms of functionality, what are my uses, use cases? So can the software deliver the functionality? What standards need the software to support? And what data do I need to work with? So do we talk about raster vectors? Do we have files or databases? So is it important for me to have a database access? Uh, platforms, the easy question. So do all my users work with Windows, Linux, or even Mac? Do I have a mixed audience? Uh, support, what is the language of your users? So for instance, well, of course, most of the projects are English-based. So that's not a big deal if you write to a, a user list. But if you 
it would be now in Spain or Portuguese and uh, Portugal, then this question comes up for sure. Because you want to always ask in your own language, if possible. Then do you need hotline or emergency support? So do you have a critical application or not? Or is, and then is it likely that customiz customization is needed? So if you just can go with a software out of a box, you have a different, well, no needs. Maybe you can even, you don't even, even need any support then. Uh, but also, and it's one of the things I really like to highlight on talks, is it an option to use cheap proprietary software or use proprietary software at all if there is a low price attached? Because I think it's almost important we want to use the best tools to fulfill our task in a good way. And it's not about being just cheap. Well, <laughs> is it about being free too? Well, of course, there's other things like vendor lock in in these things, but but sometimes if you, if it can make you do your task in ten minutes and with the other software it takes you three days, and you are someone who needs to deliver a map in ten minutes, like let's take a news portal, news agency. You know, that's where these mistakes or these things happening. You, you watch CNN and then Cuba is on the other side of the world or somewhere like that. Or the, the capital has a wrong name. <laughs> so it's because these people need to do these in five minutes. So uh, my conclusions. Can you implement STIs with free and open source software successfully? Yes, you can. Because uh, for all software categories needed, we have software available. That's what I just showed. But I would, so there's always a but. And here I would say, only if you know your requirements. So that's the first important thing. Check out what you really need. And then, well, especially if it comes to uh, implementing a spatial data infrastructure, you should have a dedicated technology person or even a whole IT department to customize these things. And that also means that these people like to explore new terrain, you know, not just like to do phone calls to someone ever, ever else too. And so the idea is also you can make an informed choice by learning from others too. So that's, you know, just you're not sitting in your box. <laughs> so that's the talk. And then, so in terms of desktops here, whoa. Desktop software, I, I have two articles here on that web page which compare, try to compare desktop stuff on my own home page. I have basically what I presented here. Uh, so this talk is there as, a, as an art manuscript article so you could read about these things too. Except the evaluation stuff which is to be published elsewhere. And then the website of the OSGO with, which hosts mo most of the projects. And for those people who are interested, we are trying to find found an open source JS software group, interest group in Calgary. We may have the first meeting either end of April, beginning of May. So we're just checking who of the people is interested, trying to get get us some some people. So if you are interested in that, talk to me. <laughs> so maybe you. So that's it. If there's questions, I'm hanging out.